Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP. So the DHCP protocol operates on UDP ports 68 and 67. DHCP is based on a series of messages. You have a discovery message, an offer, request, and acknowledgments. So what happens is a client will come online and they will send out a DHCP discover packet. Then a DHCP server, assuming it sees it, will then offer a DHCP offer and they offer an IP address that the client could then potentially use. It is then up to the client to collect all the offers it receives, decide usually the, which, the first one that comes, but which one they're going to accept, and then they're going to request that of that DHCP server specifically. After it has been requested, they will, I mean, the request will be sent out broadcast so that all the other DHCP servers who made offers will see the request. And then the acknowledgement comes back, letting the client know that the request has been acknowledged and they can then start using that address. In addition to that, they will get a, a lease. So they get a certain amount of time they can use this address at the end of which they will have to renew. Well, actually, somewhere in the middle, they'll renew their lease, but at the end of which they would lose the address. So some security issues with DHCP. If you have rogue DHCP servers, they can give out addresses and that can be a problem. It could mean security issues. It could mean um, someone's giving you something incorrect. Sometimes you'll have someone plug a wireless access point, some kind of a uh, home router in your network backwards and it'll start issuing out addresses. You can block that on the, the switch, but you know, if it's not blocked, they can cause all kinds of havoc. Um, clients can spoof MAC addresses to gain additional access. So if you want to get access and you know that a specific IP address gets it or a certain MAC address gets it through the firewall, you can spoof addresses. And this isn't really a DHCP problem so much as an issue with MAC addresses and security and everything there. But you can spoof things and get more access. Um, clients can also obtain multiple IP addresses by presenting multiple MAC addresses. So if you have a client that is trying to create a denial of service type situation, they could present a whole bunch of different MAC addresses, get a whole bunch of different IP addresses, and then lock them all up so they're not available to anybody else. Some of the useful packages. The most useful package here is the DHCP package, which includes the DHCP server which is DHCPD. There are other ones that are there. You have a DHCP libs and DHCP common, which are used basically in order to get DHCP and the client to run. So the directories that are interesting, there is the ETC DHCP directory, which contains all of your DHCPD configuration files. So you can look in there and see what's there. You have your network configuration and those are in the etc sysconfig network scripts directory. All of them start with the ifcfg, and then it's usually dash eth0 or ens32 or something else. So you have to go look and see what, what interfaces you have, um, and then you can go configure those. If you're running as a DHCP server, you can see the var lib dhcpd dhcpd.leases file, which will contain all of the leases you've given out. You might note that there are multiple copies of the same lease that's there because sometimes a client will request something more than once. It might go down, come back up again before the lease is expired, and it might get a new renewed lease. Anyway, that leases file keeps track of all your leases for you. And then there is the var log messages file, which contains all kinds of information, such as all of your your discoveries and offers and all those things can show up in your var log messages file. So the configurations for the DH server, DHCP server are in the etc DHCP directory. The following is example dhcpd.conf file. You can see right there in the top you have a the option domain name. You tell it your domain name, option domain name servers. You tell it what DNS servers people are using to get out. You tell a default lease time. This one has 300, which is 300 seconds. A maximum lease time, which right here is 1,200 seconds. So these are very short-term leases. So a, a default lease of five minutes with a maximum lease of 20 minutes. 
Obviously, you want to have much, much longer times, um, but they're in seconds. The subnet right there, you can see we have a subnet being configured to give out information. So this is the 10.0.0 slash 16 subnet, and we are handing out addresses in that subnet only to 10.10.0.100 through 10.10.0.150. So there's only, you know, uh, 51 addresses that are being handed out. And then we're telling them that their default gateway is 10.10.0.1. So that is your, the routers is your default gateway. You can also, in addition to just giving out a range of addresses, you can give out static addresses. So the DHP server can be configured to assign the same IP address to a machine using the MAC address. This is very common in situations where you have a machine that has to come up with the same address every time because it provides services of some sort. The following example to assign a printer. So the printer had the MAC address of 00 colon 11 colon 22 colon 33 colon 44 colon 55. And then you could have it have a fixed address of 10.10.10.10 and that would be the information you give out. And so you put that inside of that subnet section on the previous slide to make sure it gets that information and also to make sure it still gets the router information and DNS information. The DHP service needs to be started in order to start listening. You can use the systemctl command to start the DHP server. So you use systemctl start dhpd.service to start it up. And other options you have is stop, restart, status. Um, if you wanted to start at boot time, you can do enable and then you can disable to make it not start at boot time. Having the service running won't guarantee you can get anything. You still need to make sure you can get through the firewall. And in order to receive requests, you need to make sure that the ports are open. So you really need to be doing both because it does it sends out and receives on different port numbers. But you can use the firewall dash cmd dash dash add dash service equals DHB command to add the DHB service to your firewall. If you want to be permanent, once again, you need to make sure you add the dash dash permanent to the end. So firewall dash cmd space dash dash add dash service equals DHB space dash dash permanent to make it permanent and make it there when you start it. You can verify the services are present in the firewall as well with the firewall dash cmd space dash dash list dash all command and that will get it there. Once you have your server running, you can go check your messages and stuff like that. And, but if you're having problems and clients aren't getting things, you can go troubleshoot the clients first. If they, it's a physical connection, you want to make sure that you have the clients there. Um, you make sure the clients have NICs and cables. And um, you can use the LSPCI command on Linux to verify to make sure you have a NIC a driver. That can be important. You can verify the server address is static. So your DHCP server must have a static address, otherwise it will not work properly. It doesn't work off a of DHCP, so don't try. And you want to verify the firewall allows connections, so you can look at that. Verify or look at the logs to see if there's anything in there. Check the leases to see if it really is giving out leases or, you know, if they're being handed out. Um, if you are setting up a network, you can actually have your configuration have multiple different um, subnet sections. And then if you have multiple subnet sections, you might be servicing different subnets based on information being forwarded. So you want to verify the routers for the request. If they need to do that, you want to verify the spanning tree is not a problem. Sometimes spanning tree is configured so that a machine booting up will be assumed to be a switch in which case it will block everything until it is determined that the machine is not a switch and then will allow communication through. So you want to make sure the span tree is not blocking anything. And you want to make sure that the switches are allowing you to answer so your machine needs to be connected to an interface that is allowed to send out your, your DHCP offers. So you can receive the discoveries, but you can't make an offer unless, well, you can make an offer, but your offer won't get out unless the interface is allowing you to get out. And so you want to make sure that the switches are not blocking you from making offers. 
And that is the end of this section. So, good luck.